If you think the bowling ball is just a glorified marble, then think again. From the core to the finger holes, everything about this ball is engineered to improve your odds of bowling a strike every time. How is a bowling ball designed to help you have the game of your life? We're at Ebonite, a world leader in bowling balls, to find out. I'm here with Jennifer and Loretha. We're at the very, very head of this assembly for bowling balls at Ebonite in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, folks. And this is essentially where we find the nucleus of the ball, where that gets formed. And all these sort of mixtures of resins, these plastics, are all brought together to this tube. Now, I'm just going to fill this mold here with the resin that becomes the core. And eventually, they're going to get baked and hardened. Once solidified, this resin becomes the center or core of the ball. Yeah. yeah, this is the core. There are nearly two dozen core shapes in the Ebonite stock room, and it's the shape of each one that defines how the ball's gonna roll. Hey, Billy, can I have one of those cores? So, this is the beginning of the ball. Let me ask the obvious question. Why is it not perfectly round? Well, to answer that question, we first got to look at the idea of mass. Even though the bowling ball is classified by weight, the real issue isn't how gravity pulls on it, but how hard it is to shake and twist as it goes down the lane. Some balls, like house balls, have a perfectly round core inside and therefore a perfectly symmetrical axis. Those balls roll exactly as you'd expect every time. But balls with asymmetrical cores twist more readily in one direction than another. So these balls don't roll down the lane, they actually wobble. It gives it essentially power steering. So you're creating an imbalance. An imperfect ball allows yes. the player more control. Right, it's a perfectly imperfect ball. To take advantage of this power steering, it's crucial to know how that core is positioned inside the ball and which way it will ultimately spin. Ah, a fresh basket of cores. A core twists along three axes, X, Y, and Z. The X and Y axes dictate the all-important wobble, so they're measured and marked. We're ready to move on. Hey, where do they put the finger holes in this? Then the axes are drilled. I'm just going to suction some of this resin as it's coming off here. Two holes, a big one and a small one. And voila, we have the hole. Very important. Now, eventually, this little doodad will be positioned inside this hole. This pen will stay in place throughout the entire process, layer after layer, from core to veneer, pointing to this hole. But what exactly is it pointing out? All right, gentlemen, Lou and I are with Ron Hicklin, who's the chief engineer here at Ebonite. I've, I've drilled this hole, and I essentially know that it's going to tell the pro shop eventually where this core is inside the ball. But why drill it here? Why not drill it over here or over here? things you drill are identifying the principal axes of this core. This is the hardest axis about which to twist the core. This is the easiest one, the big hole. The pro shop needs to know where these two points are located so that they can best orient your finger holes for control over that wobble. Really what's going on here is the orientation of these holes is going to allow you ball motion or type of hook. And the more hook you have, the more entry angle you can achieve, the more entry angle you can achieve likelier you are to get a strike. So essentially, it's an X on the map to the, to the guy who drills the finger holes, telling him or her how to get the most out of your ball. Exactly. So what happens next? So now that we've crafted our core, it's time to turn this odd-looking shape into a ball. And for that, we mark our holes, center the core into a second spherical mold, and fill it in to form the outer core. This is my favorite part at Ebonite. Paper clips. Hold that together. Sounds easy, right? 
not quite. Every ball has to be 27 inches in circumference, but it can weigh anywhere between 6 and 16 pounds. So, how do you make same size balls with such varying weights? Well, it all comes down to tiny bubbles. So Ebonite's task next is to create a spherical object without undoing all the engineering of that core. Well, to do that, they wrap the inner core, the core we've been dealing with, in an outer core that is a much lower density. Ebonite uses filler made of tiny glass micro bubbles. They're like mini Christmas ornaments, as light as styrofoam, but extremely durable and tough. To get the balls to the right weight, they mix these glass bubbles with another denser filler. Varying the proportion of these two fillers changes the ball's weight without changing its size. To get the most out of the ball's power steering, it's critical not only where you place the core, but how it's centered. We can't have that sticking out. How's that? OK. Too short. Too short? Cut too short. I cut it too short. He's trying to center the mask, but he's also trying to orient it exactly right. Well, ultimately, what happens when you have the proper orientation, you're going to create what's called a top weight. The top weight is used by the pro shop to know exactly how deep to drill the finger holes so that when it's all said and done, you can get the ball balanced the way you want it to be. As the resin dries inside the mold, our creations are actually starting to look like bowling balls. Well, I'm here with Brian Hickey, who's the director of operations here at Ebonite. And what we have here is our mold. We poured our resin filler in here. Now, Brian, how do I get this thing apart? Crack it like an egg. Crack it like an egg, Crack really? Like the introduction of the asymmetrical core in the 90s gave bowling a big popularity boost. It was easier to bowl a strike, so more and more people came out to play. Now some 70 million Americans hit the lanes every year. So to keep up with the growing sport, Ebonite makes up to 5,000 balls a day. It's a lot of balls. Once again, Discovery slowing up production in American industry. <laughs> At the Ebonite factory in Kentucky, our bowling balls have the power steering core. Now we need some traction. So we put the ball into a third mold and pour in some plastic. This is no ordinary plastic coating. It's chemically constructed to give the ball a firm grip on the lane, allowing the bowler even more control. Hey, Alicia, give the professor a drink. Look at that. It looks like red wine here, right? Oh, it looks like blood. When she served it up to me, it was consisted of polyol molecules and isocyanate molecules. And they are now reacting with one another like crazy in there. It's as the molecules grow, it becomes more and more viscous until finally it's so viscous that if I begin pouring it, it should harden right before oh, our eyes. Oh, cool. Can I touch that? You can touch it. It's already gelled. The other cool thing, which you can't see, is the third material in here, the plasticizer. At this temperature, the plasticizer starts evaporating, leaving microscopic holes in the ball's surface. These holes will soak up some of the oil that coats the lane and create traction. Traction allows the ball to change rotation onto its preferred axis and hook so that it hits the pins from the side. This side area, known as the pocket, is key because it gives the best angle for strike after strike after strike. It only takes two minutes for the polyurethane coating to harden on the ball's surface, but it's still got a lot more baking to do. The plastic, that urethane outer shell, is still forming. The chemicals are still reacting, and this ball continues to get harder and harder. In the oven, the veneer cooks, and the plasticizer continues evaporating to achieve the right porosity. In this case, the more porous it is, the better the performance. The balls pass from the piping hot oven right into the fridge. That feels real nice. This cools the plastic down so we can finish making our balls. The exposed pin heads are now the markings that the pro shop will look for when they drill the finger holes.
The only way to prove that this ball has the high performance we claim, the power steering, is to test it. If the ball is made correctly, the spin will eventually rotate the ball onto its preferred axis, marked still by the pinhead, and this etched sign. Ready? Get set. Go. Look what's over here now. It loves that axis. That's the power steering. This ball turns its rotation to spin about that pin. We got power steering, we got traction, now we need some speed. That's where polishing comes in. This process gives the ball its tread, helping it slice through the lane's oily finish and speed toward the pins. The result, incredible striking power. To polish the ball, we first smooth over any rough patches. This grinder shaves a tenth of an inch off the circumference in just 30 seconds. The balls are weighed one last time and then showered in polish. The oil conditions of the lane will then determine the amount of polish you want. If the ball's too glossy, it will hydroplane on a heavily oiled lane. This ball may look finished, but there's one more step. We'll get your, your hole size, and then we'll go right back there and start drilling holes. Don't make bowling harder than it is. I like the way you think, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> all the calculating and engineering, the physics and chemistry, it all comes down to this final stop on the assembly line, the pro shop, where they can literally make or break a bowler's game. Huh? Reach around my arm right there, and let's see how you do it. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Now, you want me to grab your wrist? <laughs> the pro shop measures our fingers and the span of our grip, then uses the two axes still clearly marked to map out the holes. I'm ready. You all ready, huh? Let's go, Raj. Then he drills. Now, if they're off on their measurements, even the highest performing ball thrown by the most expert bowler will miss its mark. Every model of every Ebonite ball goes down these lanes to answer the very critical question. Will this ball do what it's designed to do? This is kind of really where the rubber meets the road. So how do these guys measure and analyze their balls? They use telemetry. What we have is a tracking system here, and what it does is it uses video to actually record the ball going down the lane. Recorded and analyzed against the expectations of that particular ball as the ball goes down yeah. a lane, collects the information as to where the ball is on the lane, and then what you can actually see is the ball path that the ball took. Is it allows us to see exactly how the core relates to the coverage, relates to the ball, relates to the lane condition as the bowler is actually using it. Oh, cool. My custom-made bowling ball has the right telemetry. Where's the thumb hole? <laughs> but will it help get my game out of the gutter? Because it's bad. When I'm down here, I still got the ball. So when I get ready to come through here, thumb comes out, follow through with the fingers. You just open up a whole new follow world the for fingers, me. And then you're able to guide it. Wow. I'm learning here that the right ball still won't strike if it's in the wrong hands. But with some really good coaching, it all starts coming together. Yeah. You're going to do all this? Yeah. Now. It's yeah, got to it's right be clean. Come okay. out of it first. All right. And eventually, well, it's not a perfect game. Yes! <laughs> but I am very proud. And I'm going to enjoy this moment because it's the last time it's ever going to happen.